thanks for coming out to our panel. As Rose mentioned, uh, we're going to talk about strategies for how you can use supporting video content to attract attention, build audience, and ultimately convert that into sales for your feature film or series. Uh, my name is Jason Sandy. I am a curator for Vimeo. Um, just a little bit of brief background. I I've been working in online video since about 2007 when I founded a short film website called Short of the Week, which uh, reviews short films that are freely available to watch online. And uh, IFP and True Filmmaker Mag did me a big honor by um, honoring that work, putting me on the Filmmaker 25 New Faces list in 2011. Uh, shortly thereafter, I, I joined Vimeo, where as a curator, uh, among my responsibilities, I program the Staff Picks channel, and I also curate the Vimeo.com slash on-demand homepage. Um, increasingly, uh, a lot of my time is taken up working with filmmakers who want to use Vimeo on-demand um, and helping craft strategies for how they can use our unique tool set uh, to support and promote their project the best way possible. Um, I want to introduce these other guys too. Uh, should I go ahead or do you guys want to introduce yourselves? <laughs> um, Mark Schiller is to my right. Uh, he doesn't need an introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. Um, he is the founder and CEO of Bond Strategy and Influence, which is an influential uh, communications outfit. Um, he's done groundbreaking digital campaigns for films such as Exit Through the Gift Shop, Senna, and The Imposter. And recently he announced a new initiative called Bond 360, which, uh, let me use your words so that I don't get them wrong. Um, it's a new initiative that provides strategic con consultation, marketing, public relations, financing, and technical support to help filmmakers connect their films and related products directly with fans. Uh, and then to his right, we have Ryan Koo, who's a filmmaker, website entrepreneur, founder and editor of the popular filmmaker resource, No Film School. And he's currently in development on his feature film debut, Manchild, which is uh, set in the seedy world of youth basketball, where agents and boosters prey upon young, up and coming superstars. Uh, he did a Kickstarter campaign for Manchild, which at the time I think was the largest narrative uh, film that had ever uh, been funded on Kickstarter. And uh, kind of pertaining to this talk, he did a really interesting thing this spring where to, um, to attract partners and uh, build excitement for this upcoming feature, he made a short prequel film that he released free on the internet, and I'm sure we're gonna talk about that lots in the upcoming minutes. Um, so yeah, before we dive in, I just kind of want to provide something of a sort of thesis statement for the panel. Um, web video is, you know, a big thing. <laughs> I don't think I need to kind of qualify that statement. Uh, but in case you want it to be qualified anyway, uh, a recent market study uh, predicted that web video traffic is going to outpace the combined traffic of Facebook and Twitter sometime in 2014. Uh, so what that means for you as filmmakers is that your potential audience has this sort of insatiable desire to watch short clips on the internet. And that provides a huge opportunity to relatively cheaply be able to build, uh, build awareness uh, for your project to create strategies to engage your growing fan base, and then ultimately convert that awareness you know, into sales. So um, that's something that we're sort of keenly aware of at Vimeo uh, when we were building Vimeo On Demand. In case you don't know, Vimeo On Demand is a new digital rental and sales platform that we unveiled six months ago at South by Southwest. It's completely open to anybody who wants to use it as long as you're a Vimeo Pro subscriber. And uh, one of the unique wrinkles that we sort of baked into that was the ability to have your trailer and any extra video content inextricably intertwined with your 
feature film or series offering. And what that means is that, <clears throat> excuse me, this free content can circulate through Vimeo and the 100 million people that come to Vimeo every month the same way that any other clip can. It can be liked and can come through feeds. It can be added to channels like staff picks. These clips can be embedded anywhere on the internet. And anytime a person watches a clip all the way through or clicks through uh, to where they would normally arrive at a clip page, they'll instead come to your Vimeo on demand sales page. Um, so we think that's neat and we think it's a huge opportunity for people to start using video creatively to help promote their feature film offerings. And we think it's going to be a big part of the direct distribution story going forward. Um, at Vimeo, you know, we're kind of new to paid content, but we understand free content. Uh, we know what does well, we know how it should be promoted, and we know who the tastemakers are who can really get behind interesting, engaging, short content and can really kick start that sort of viral process. Um, so yeah, that's my pitch. Let me get off the soapbox and start engaging these guys. Um, first up, Mark, this is kind of maybe a silly question because things are changing so rapidly, but you worked on a lot of film projects with big distributors and independent filmmakers alike. Is there a sort of standard practice for how video is used in marketing feature films right now? Yeah, there's definitely a standard practice. And, and you know, I'm trying to actively change how we use video to market films because the way that we're marketing through video um, historically has been very limiting. And, and what we typically will do is um, we will look at a film um, and we will select probably 10 clips, uh, anywhere between a minute and 90 seconds, um, as a pool, and we'll select specifically to, um, uh, to try to give people a taste of the tonality of the film, to, to really use those clips as a way to introduce people to the actual content. Um, the 10 clips will then be shared with the distributor, um, the PR team, um, and from the 10 we'll whittle it down to about six or so keeping uh, the total number um, less than 10 minutes total, including footage from the trailer. And that's the Academy rules, although I don't think the Academy ever goes online and counts the minutes. Um, we, 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 stay, we stay to that 10-minute um, uh, that rule, and we never want to put out prior to release of the film more than 10 minutes. We then take those, those clips and we put it on Vimeo. Um, uh, or other services, uh, sometimes you know many, sometimes only one. Um, and then as we get closer to release, we will pitch exclusive scenes as, a, as scenes as exclusives um, to various digital media outlets um, to get um, more coverage for the film going into opening weekend. Um, so all the clips are, are then put into kind of a, a, a wish list grid, um, a clip you know, would go to IndieWire, another clip would go to um, uh, a blog maybe for the genre, um, some clips would go to IMDB, and because they're exclusive for 24 hours to those sites, um, you get a um, considerable amount of promotion. So in a way, it's, it's looking at bartering exclusive content for exposure. Um, uh, and, you know, that's typically how most films look at video content. Sometimes there'll be an EPK, um, they'll be behind the scenes, and we'll look at, um, at um, uh, putting together a featurette and looking for the best outlet. So most video to date for theatrical releases, or films that have theatrical releases, video is used for barter for PR. And it's split up into different opportunities to maximize the exposure. So you're using it literally to get more awareness because you don't have the type of advertising dollars that the big um, uh, studios have, and in many instances, you don't have the stars, you just have a great film, um, and that's the best way to get the type of, of, uh, of awareness. It works, you know, it's how everybody does it. It doesn't build community, it doesn't build loyalty, it doesn't do anything more than just give you exposure. So why I said I'm looking to change that is that 
it's important to start to shift and start to make video much more um, uh, strategic, not just leading into open week, opening weekend, but for the long run of the film, for, for the entire breadth um, and depth that that film will be online. Nowadays, a lot of people see a movie, they love the movie, and they go online and they Google to learn more after they've seen the movie. We need to create video content to serve that audience, to keep them engaged, to keep them motivated. We need to play into subscription. Subscribe to clips for a filmmaker that you love. Subscribe to a, a sequence of content that's coming out that you know you'll get when you log on. We need to do more original content um, for the web to create community prior to a film release. It's difficult to do because most filmmakers, they just are trying to finish their film in time. They have no ability to think about new narratives and additional content. But when you get into that mindset, that's when you start early, you know, is when you have the ability to, to you know, to look at the web um, uh, from the perspective of, of developing community through narrative. Um, and that shift is very difficult to do when you're looking at films um, uh, in the traditional distribution system. Um, but it's shifting. Yeah, it's sort of the transition between creating somebody who's aware of your film and then turning him into a fan. Well, we're really just throwing spaghetti up against the wall. At the end of the day, we're just saying, you know, let's use everything we have, let's try to get as much as we can. And look, awareness is the number one thing that you need to get somebody to want to go see your movie. You know, like music and records, I remember when I marketed records, if you ask a fan of, you know, Depeche Mode, why didn't you buy the new Depeche Mode record, the number one answer is going to be, I had no idea it was in stores. I had no idea it's out there. If you ask a fan of a filmmaker, why didn't you go see the new movie or buy it, number the number one reason they're going to say they didn't do it is I had no idea it was out. So awareness is, cre is critical. And, and you know, video can be a great way to get aware awareness. But at the same time, it, it's very limiting in what it ultimately could deliver if you're doing it in that manner. Mm -hmm. I, have a, I have a couple of questions about that, actually. Uh, so if you were getting involved with a filmmaker earlier in the process, um, do you think it's a hard argument to make when they're budgeting to say, you should set aside a percentage to create additional content outside of the feature that can be used for that purpose. And then on the Vimeo side, when someone's running a Vimeo Pro site and selling their feature, what kind of um, engagement is there? Can you collect email addresses? Like what, what are the tools that you guys offer? Well, absolutely, and that's why we started working with filmmakers early. Because you can't do it at the last minute. If, you know, once an editing you know, room is shut down and you stop working on a project, it's very hard to start working on the project again. And nobody's there to give guidance on what to create that can be not just a marketing asset, but a monetization asset. I mean, what we're now doing, I did it with Eugene Jarecki on House I Live In, where you know, he showed me 30 additional minutes of individual segments, and we talked about marketing and branding. So you know, he has the ability, because the way he runs his, his studio at Charlotte Street, to, you know, to have editors continue to work on things. So he cut um, uh, these five minute segments called Drug War Dispatches, and um, uh, you know, the, 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 you know the, the mandate was, you know, get these out there. Get, get them, get, let's use them as marketing tools. Um, and I said, Eugene, you know, I just saw something really interesting. For me, I saw um, uh, on Netflix um, uh, um, uh, a movie where um, uh, when I logged back in, um, there were additional little 30-minute, you know, addendums to the movie that I had just watched. I said, rather than give these videos away, because they do work as standalone. If you didn't see the movie, there's a, an arc there, there's a story, there's, an, it, you know, you don't need to see the movie to enjoy the additional 30 minutes when it was together. Why don't we go to Netflix? Um, we were working with Film Buff and they were great. Um, and when we sell it in that streaming window, Hulu, Netflix, Amazon, why don't we offer an additional 30 minutes of content um, uh, as an incentive for the deal that was being made. And if you go on Netflix today, you watch House I Live In, and then you'll see that there's an additional 30 minutes. They were, that footage was made for marketing purposes, um, but it was used much more strategically for the, the income of the film. And I really believe in that, but you can't do that if you're starting after the film is at a festival. 
You, you, you just won't achieve it. Everybody wants to do it, but if you're not thinking about it while you're editing and, and, and budgeting it in and thinking about this additional content, and it's not that Netflix is gonna take it every time, it's that you will be able to use that content. If anything, what we could do is, you know, if you've seen the movie, you know, go to the website and there's 30 more minutes. We're, we're now releasing 90 more minutes of content from that movie um, as a package, as a, as a, as a bundled package. Um, that's where video should be going. Um, uh, most people see the trailer. You know, at the end of the day, the trailer is the most important video asset you will ever have. Clips are important for sure, but the next wave of video is, is um, uh, as, as you're alluding to, is in the production process and the editing process. It's not about excluded scenes, you know. You know, if a scene didn't make it into the movie as a single scene, there's a reason for that. But if 30 minutes of character, ex you know, didn't make it, you know. We have a documentary called Particle Fever. It follows five scientists as they're searching for the Higgs boson. They actually followed eight. So there's three characters that have full arcs, full story arcs. They just didn't make it into the final cut. It that that, that those characters have a life online. Typically, if you didn't know how to do it, and from a marketing perspective, it's limiting to have that. But if nobody's helping you to understand that strategy, you would just it would just stay in the you know on the on the hard drive in your editing you know materials. It would never be used. It would never be finished. Um, so that's why Bond 360, when you describe Bond 360, we created it specifically because distributors don't have time with their filmmakers to do this. They just don't, it's not something that's easy to do in that model. Right, so, so for a documentary, I think that's more organic to the process because you know, with a documentary, you might have 400 hours of footage. With a narrative, you know, it might be more challenging to, to create additional content. Would you say that offering it was a Netflix exclusive to extras. Did that, you know, was that, did that have a significant impact on the Netflix deal? Like, is it something that yes. on your next film you could say, hey, we can value that now and say that maybe we'll get a better deal from Netflix if we spend extra money on making this other content? Yeah, and I don't know if Netflix is going to do it for every film and if they're going to continue to do it, but it worked for that film at that time. We took it, we, it, it's Forks Over Knives was the film that I was referring to, which I saw it for the first time, and I just think it's a brilliant way of doing it. But if it's not Netflix, then it'll be on Vimeo. Like, it doesn't, that, or, or you know, just, just say to people, if you've seen the movie, here's an, why, why are we not going back to Exit Through the Gift Shop and Senna? The community of those movies are growing every single week because of Netflix and iTunes and people seeing it. If I ask half the room here if you saw that movie, those that did, 90% of you are not gonna say you went to the Sunshine Theater. You saw it probably on Netflix and, 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 um, uh, and iTunes or some digital way of seeing the movie or VOD. So the community grows. We're not going back with new video content to that community. We're not, there's no you know, addendum of what happened since the movie came out. We're starting to do that. You know, I just hooked up, you know, we're doing an interview with Eugene, with a MSNBC journalist for House I Live In because a lot has happened in the war on drugs since that movie has come out. There's been a lot of legislation that, that, that has come out that it's a very different environment than it was, you know, before the elections. We can update people that saw that movie through video. We can go back and say and revisit those, those storylines, revisit those characters. Um, and if you structure the way that you think about your production company to accommodate that, and you do it economically, there's an incredible amount of opportunity, whether it's Netflix or, or whoever. It doesn't matter the outlet. What matters is that you're thinking that way. And that said, you know, Vimeo has that functionality in it. You can purchase a film as a series and continually update with extra content over time that a person who's made the original purchase will have access to but isn't giving it away. Are those, are those email updates, or how do you stay in touch with it? Um, right now, I think the best way is to actually, uh, we have, Vimeo is social. You can follow people on, on Vimeo, and what that does is every new video that they upload, everything that they like, uh, will end up coming through a sort of central feed, similar to how your Facebook feed or something like that works. And we're also implementing um, soon a way for filmmakers to, to have better ability to actually contact directly uh, the people who are their fans who purchase a film. Um, 
what you're talking about sort of tickled in my mind. Um, you know, we always go back to indie game, and I, I guess you talked about it in Toronto recently as well. But they did really run such a smart sort of campaign for their film, and I was just looking through their Vimeo uh, feed um, last night, actually, and it was such a clever mix of content. Um, it was behind the scenes, it was one-on-one um, -on -one talking head videos with the actual filmmakers themselves, it was deleted sequences, and I, you see this deleted scene, it'll get 50,000 views, and then like kind of a, a throwaway, sort of one minute, almost kind of Vine or Instagram-ish kind of video of a friend of theirs actually watching the film for the first time in his sort of delighted expression. And that would get like 12,000 views. And then the very next video they uploaded was the trailer, which ended up doing really well and getting like 500,000 views. And what it seemed to me was that there's your big pieces of content which can really drive awareness, but then there's value in these tiny bits of content as well, which really build up social capital and kind of fuel that uh, kind of community building sentiment. You know, Ryan, you, you have a large community uh, with no film school and what you're building through Man Child. Like, what is the importance of um, continually having content that your, your fans can interact with? Uh, yeah, I mean, I actually want to tie that back into indie game. I thought, you know, of the many, many smart things that James and Lisanne have said about their whole strategy and their release, is that every decision they made was about making their second film. And that, you know, obviously making a first film is hard. I'm presently an example of that. But, uh, you know, for them, if they had signed a traditional distribution deal, then they wouldn't be in touch with their fan base to reach out and let them know that they had another project. So, um, you know, I'm looking forward to when Vimeo has that sort of email tool because that's been the number one success uh, on No Film School has been giving away exclusive content in exchange for an email address. Um, Twitter's great, Facebook is great, the Vimeo social feed is great, but those things rely on someone going to those places and checking their feed, whereas an email is a proactive thing that you can send them and say, hey, I've got something. So, uh, Film School, it wasn't video content, but I wrote a 114-page guide to using DSLRs uh, to shoot movies, and I gave it away free in exchange for an email address, and anyone can unsubscribe immediately after they get it, so there's no, um, you know, it's not a spam campaign, but 90% of the people who download it stay subscribed. Um, and so now we have 120,000 email addresses with an excellent open rate, which is something that, you know, some film studios can't even say. So um, I think, if you had exclusive video content, you know, maybe Netflix offers more money for it and that's great, but you could also, you know, build up your own website and put that clip on there in exchange for an email address and then, you know, hopefully get your second film made and build, uh, you know, Kevin Kelly has this thing, a thousand true fans are enough to support an artist. And so I think if you have a loyal audience that, you know, and you are better in touch with them, that that is something that can make a big difference in your career more so than having a distributor necessarily, you know, sell your movie to a lot of people and then you not being able to reach those fans uh, for your next project. So that, that sort of exclusive content is, is a really big I thing. I can't underscore how important what you're saying is, is especially as, as we head into, you know, new areas of distribution, um, uh, the tools that Vimeo and others are, are giving people to use are getting better and better. They're extraordinary and 90% of it's not being used, you know, it's just, you don't know what you can actually do to push these tools um, forward. And um, the data, owning the data, you, you know, I'm, I, I completely agree. If you own the community, you need to own the data. It makes no sense to own your audience but not own the data to go direct. I actually, James and Lizanne, I, I love working with those guys and I absolutely do believe that they are the, you know, the, the one to watch. They're continuing to innovate. But I think it's because of something that, that they're not doing that you said they are. They're not doing a campaign. They are you know, brand managers that are managing the brand um, uh, and the, the asset. And they're, because they were immersed in the world of video games, and their film is about video games, they understand software. 
and they're not precious with their film as art so that when you say software, you're like, oh no, I'm not going there. You know, my movie is, is, you know, is not to be looked at as software. But once you get over that, that, that mindset and you say, yeah, let's treat this movie like software, you have an incredible amount of, of, of opportunities and they're willing to experiment. You know, everything is not so precious. If they, you know, succeed in one idea, great. If another idea fails, the community is fine with that. They're not judging everything that, you know, that, that they need. And sometimes it's good to kind of, you know, be a little bit flawed in a way because it shows that you're human. It shows that you're not a marketer, you know. Um, I can't, as a marketer, I can't compete with the passion of filmmakers, with the ideas of filmmakers. My job is to filter that, to enhance it, to, to amplify it. But when a marketer tries to become, you know, the, 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 the benevolent, you know, person who's going and creating goodwill, we can do it as an ambassador, but we're an ambassador to the filmmaking team. Um, and I, I have to adjust how I think because of the power of filmmakers and the power that they have. Email is the best marketing tool, hands down. It's not sexy, nobody wants to hear that. They all wanna hear about how their Facebook page should be done and how their you know, Twitter feed should be and all of that's fine. In terms of getting people to watch your film and to, to act, there is nothing better than email. And you know, uh to make it more of a practical thing, uh, you know, I'd recommend if you have a website, whatever you're running it on, you could go get a free MailChimp account, and you can have up to I think now it's 2,000 subscribers mm -hmm. for free, and uh, you know, so just you can go there and have a pop up. You can build a form using their WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get tools. I mean, it's not something that uh, requires a degree in engineering to do. So, you know, start collecting email addresses now, even if it's a few dozen. Uh, you know, long term, that could that could really make a difference. I want to track back to something that you said that I think was really interesting when you were talking about indie game. That nothing, as a marketer, you can't compete with the passion and the identification that audiences have with the creators themselves. And I remember I was here yesterday for the Our Nixon panel with Penny Lane and uh, Brian Fry. And that was the thing, they were talking about their Kickstarter campaign, and that was the thing that was the takeaway for me was an interesting thing they said, which was the power of the narrative of your film. It's not the story of your film, like not what happens in your film, but the narrative of you creating the film with you as the creator, sort of the central actor, and sort of the power that has to be able to gain free exposure in media and to really get audiences to identify with that sort of journey, uh, a, you know, in conjunction with the actual film itself, we work very closely with Penny, and um, I wasn't here uh, to to hear that that session, and I wish I was because she she's very good at creating or or putting the seeds to create a a, a visual and a language for the film. As a marketer, that's the first thing that I, that I look to do. I can't do a great campaign for a film unless I have a language to work with. And I know that sounds very obtuse, but usually you work with assets. I need a certain amount of stills, I need certain clips, I need a poster, and I need that, and you do need all of that. But what you really need to, to define is what, how do I talk about this movie? How do I, what's my language that I'm using? What's the positioning, which is very different than a synopsis, you know? Synopsis is the story of the movie, what happens in the movie. A positioning is, is your opportunity to say why this movie matters or should matter to, to audiences, both niche audiences and the broader general audience. And that's what I try to do, and I try to work with somebody like Penny, and when you see a social media campaign that works, and, and you know you should definitely go to the Our Nixon social pages because you'll see that there's an unlimited reservoir to work from on Our Nixon because Penny provided a, a language and Cynodyme supported the ability to create a way to talk about that film which, which really resonates. And you know, Ryan, you've been able to do something similar and your short film Amateur is sort of a way of accomplishing a lot of what 
Mark uh, was just talking about. You know, we actually have like a one minute clip from it and I want to play it now, otherwise we won't get to it. Technical issues. It'd be great if I like worked for a tech company or something, right? So one minute still. Amazing. There we go. Where are you going, huh? You're dribbling the ball a lot. You're dribbling the ball. You want me to take it, don't you? You want to go there? Come on. That's mine. That's mine. Ha! 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 Give me that. Give me that. Give me that. What the fuck? Where you going? Thank you. Where are you going? I need you to play D. I need you to play. Come on, come on, come on. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. This game over now. This game over. You ain't gonna reach. Got you. Gang, baby. Yo. Gang. Yo. Can I help you? Anton Lyles. Yeah, Berto Dominguez. <laughs> cool. So that's the uh, first minute of what is a nine minute short film that uh, after, after two years writing the feature Manchild about a 13-year-old basketball player, um, I felt as a director the best thing I could do would, have a, would be to make a proof of concept. And uh, in this case, I wanted to take one of the minor characters from the feature narrative and explore his life. So the recruiter in this short um, plays a role in the feature film, and this is about him recruiting an older player. And I think what, what uh, Jason was saying about, or what both Mark and Jason were saying about your narrative the reason I wanted to tell this story was not because I was a highly recruited athlete um, or highly recruited basketball player, but when I was growing up in high school, um, I was getting dunked on by highly recruited basketball players. So, you know, I had, a per I had a personal interest in that story and how that had changed once the, uh, you know, the internet not only changed filmmaking and distribution, but it also changed basketball recruiting in the sense that now a kid who uh, you know, a YouTube video of him goes up and gets millions of views and suddenly he's nationally ranked and, and is facing a lot of adult decisions and pressures. I felt that we hadn't seen that story um, told since the internet came along maybe, you know, decades after Hoop Dreams. So I wanted to make a narrative told from the, the perspective of uh, a 13-year-old kid. And I think this would have been a perfect example of a short to release if the feature was out there this would be the piece of exclusive content that we would offer in exchange for coming to our website maybe after you saw the feature. In my case, it was something where we made this not to build buzz for the feature release because the feature isn't going to be released for at least a year because we're shooting it next summer, but it was something that um, what I wanted to do with this piece of content was show that the market for this film is not just indie film and it's not just sports, and it's not just an urban market, but that it has touch points at all of them. And if you tell a human story from the perspective of this kid, you know, which is a very different way of telling a story than the kind of conversations that happen on uh, sports talk radio or, you know, people who are demonizing athletes and think they're overpaid, I just want to put you in the shoes of this kid. And, uh, you know, I think to make the short and put it out there online on Vimeo, um, the best way that we could do that was to see, well, what kind of websites are gonna pick this up? And if we can get on sports websites and film websites and uh, you know, urban culture websites, then that proves that, hey, the feature itself could speak to all these audiences and that'll help us get it made. So, um, you know, Filmmaker Magazine and IndieWire picked it up and then as sort of the experiment succeeded, uh, ESPN's Grantland picked it up and Slam Magazine picked it up. Uh, we're on Shadow and Act on IndieWire and we're supposed to be on Jay-Z's Life and Times today. So that should help us go raise additional financing to go make this feature. 
because uh, the Kickstarter campaign that I ran was great, but then I ran to the wall of trying to make a team sports film starring children for 100 grand, which um, sounds great in theory until you start looking at a real budget. So, you Did know. Do you use a publicist to do those placements that you talked about? No, I uh, sent a lot of emails. And the, the thing I'll say about that, sending emails sucks. I get a lot of emails myself, and I know how to craft one that is punching into the point. And um, all, every single one of my cold emails reaching out to a website went nowhere. But what did work is who do I know somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody? Who can introduce me? And um, of the you know, however many emails I sent to places looking for exposure, it was the it was the back door that worked every time as far as getting Such to somebody. Such an important point, yeah. And well, obviously, uh, it's, it's important to know that a, a publicist. I was assuming you were going to say that because publicists don't do what you just described. That's not. They don't understand it. They don't do it. They do something completely different, and their mindset is a very specific schedule and paradigm. The new way of of launching a film, of 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 building that momentum, is using techniques like. Like Ryan's, but you know, the, we do publicity. But again, I have to adjust the way I do publicity to be an enabler of connections and to bring people together. The 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 Twitter allows you know people to to not have to go through publicists, not have to go through these middlemen, um, and nobody wants to hear from a publicist. They want to hear from somebody who can help them write a great story. And if that is a publicist, that's great. Um, but if just the fact that your job is to PR your work is, is very limiting. Mm -hmm. and, and these are the strategies that will, that are, not even will lead to the new models working. They're the ones that are leading to those models working. Yeah, and even as a filmmaker, uh, to make those connections, it helps to have a compelling piece of content. Um, so we're running out of time. So let's get it to questions. Uh, right there. Um, yeah, I mean, that's a, a question I've been asking myself because I have Kickstarter updates, then I have an email list at No Film School, and now we're collecting emails on my own website. I think absolutely, um, you know, Kickstarter isn't going to give you the kinds of tools that you would necessarily want um, long term. So, you know, you can definitely download the, the CSV file and, and load that into MailChimp and load all those email addresses. The thing that I'm worried about, and I, I can't speak to it because I haven't gone through it yet, is loading in the database to MailChimp emailing everybody and then seeing how many of your Kickstarter updaters, you know, what was the trough, like what did you lose of those percentages. But I think you're definitely going to want to consolidate the different sources um, and something like MailChimp is probably the best way to do that. Yeah, I use Mail, I'm a big fan of MailChimp. I have a MailChimp email that sometimes I'll, I'll write, you know, every morning at 6.30 and it'll go out to the email list every day and sometimes uh, I'll wait a week because I don't really have anything good to say or anything that's on my mind that that you know that I want to share. I think you know give away your ideas. You know give give away your 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 knowledge, and if you do that, you'll engage people. You can only tell somebody you know go see my movie so many times, and um, and to repeat that over and over again is very limiting. But you can engage people in in getting deeper to understand. The you know the 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 variety of things that you've learned um, and that you're experiencing and that can become very very compelling. So um, I think each one is is very is very different. But uh, Mailchimp and having an email list, if there was one thing that every filmmaker should do, it's it's that you can literally sell out 
a weekend at the IFC Center yourself if you have a good mailing list. You can get your film in the top 20 of iTunes on the opening week if you have a good mailing list. And it's not quantity, it's quality. At the end of the day, it's passion. We have a question over here at the mic. Um, this question is for Mark. I work with a lot of filmmakers who are positioning their films for a typical um, festival premiere where distributors will, will see it and hopefully pick it up. And um, in terms of putting out video content before your festival premiere, especially at a big festival like Sundance or Toronto, that could be considered by the distributor as, as a negative, that there's this trailer out there that they, didn't, they don't control and they're not controlling the messaging. So how, in terms of timing, what would you um, tell filmmakers to do in terms of generating content before that premiere and how that should be made available? It, it is a great question and so many filmmakers make a mistake by listening to the demands of the festival and just saying yes to everything. You know, distributor aside, Nobody should cut a trailer until they see a film in an audience that is not your friends and is either a festival audience or some sort of way of, of, of you don't really know the film that you have until you see it with somebody who is, is there for other reasons. So absolutely, I'm 100%, no black or white on this one, do not cut your own trailer for a festival, for a distributor, never, ever, ever do it because it could be the kiss of death. Second is, is that a, a scene is, you, you should not give them a scene to get, to get out there and get in the media. But pick a scene that, that, that really represents not the film that you know you made, but the audience that you want to expose your film to. They're not always the same thing. So one or two clips is, is fine, um, as long as they're used right. But the most important one that's, mis that's, that's, that's screwed up a lot are actually the stills. The stills are the hardest one because most independent films do not have a photographer taking beautiful portraits and beautiful stills on set every day. And they scramble with what they have. And the fact of the matter is, is the stills, because of Google and Google image search, are the ones that become ubiquitous from the beginning. And as much as blogs and news outlets. You know, I've seen time and time again, it happens every week. We'll send, we'll do a story, an interview or a feature piece, and we'll send them the digital, you know, photographs that we're using. And then we look at the piece and it's like, the photograph, where the hell did they get that from? That's not what we sent them. It, it's not our marketing. And they did a Google search. They saw the one that came up the most times and they literally pulled it off of the web because it's faster to do that than to actually take our three megabit file and make it into a 100K photograph. So they're, they're, they're very lazy. Every day I see photography that is never serviced by us that's in these articles. So I actually think the most important thing are the stills because that you need and you've got to really get that right. So go back to the ProRes, you know, look at each photograph and pick one that, pick three or four, that pull you into the story, that don't tell you who the characters are. Like if your film is about a painter, you know, to see a photograph of somebody painting doesn't mean anything to anybody unless you've seen the movie. It's not pulling you in. It's just telling you this movie's about a painter. So find photography that you have to know more by going deeper. And those are the photographs that, that, that work. Um, and typically, the last thing, and I know it's a long answer, is the crazy thing is, is that the custodians of your film, your sales agents and your PR team, typically don't do this and do it well. They don't, they, t they rely on you or they'll tell you to put three photographs or a clip that will work for their purposes. You as filmmakers have to own that process and absolutely don't listen to the demands to the point that you're cutting trailers because a festival said, every other film has a trailer, where's yours? That do not do that. Okay. Uh, we are out of time, so one more question. Yeah, um, real quick, I, how would you, would you, and if so, how would you suggest using these kind of strategies for a short documentary film that's been submitted to a number of festivals? I think the, the whole festival versus online thing is really changing and, and uh, Jason wrote a great piece at Short of the Week about you know some festivals requiring you to not be online. Um, what I'm doing is the opposite. I put it online for free and I thought that was going to be the end of the day, but now we're 
we just won the audience award at NBC Universal Short Festival, and now we're playing Urban World this week. So, um, you know, I'm of the opinion that you could play a, a room and get 200 views of your short doc, but um, a short doc is probably not a lucrative thing. You probably want to get as many eyeballs on it as possible. And I will say, um, one of the best ways to do that is if you make something great and it catches Vimeo's attention, the Vimeo staff picks is the festival laurel of the online world. And uh, my short has 60,000 views right now, and 40,000 of those at least are probably just because Vimeo gave it their stamp of approval and it got went to everybody's feed. So I think for a short doc, like a Vimeo staff pick would be a great uh, strategy or, or, or you know thing to hope for, I think. Thanks. Thank you. And uh, thanks, everybody, for hanging out and listening.